<laughs> Outside of Western New York, East Aurora, and Buffalo, Miller Fillmore is really not one of the most well-known or highly regarded U.S. presidents. Right, it's just a fact. All right, we all sort of accept that. Um, and one historian who has written about Miller Fillmore says actually to discuss Miller Fillmore is to overrate him. Um, and I actually think that's in some way, that's kind of wrong, and, and Miller Fillmore does get a raw deal. But I, I actually think the reason that a lot of people don't understand Miller Fillmore, don't recognize Miller Fillmore, or maybe think Miller Fillmore is boring, is because he is so often divorced from the context in which he operated in, in his policies as President of the United States. I think a lot of times because people want to avoid the controversy of talking about slavery in the 1850s, the coming of the Civil War, the Compromise of 1850, and the slave law. So I think actually by reinserting him back into his own sort of milieu uh, and understanding the policies that he was responsible for, unpopular as though they may be, of course, Miller from War has ended up on the wrong side of history, as we say. I actually think that really gives him more traction, right? It gives people something to sort of to chew on with regards to Miller Fillmore than I think otherwise he might be lacking. Of course, the University of Buffalo, we commemorate him sort of physically on campus in a number of ways that you may or may not be aware of. On North Campus, which is where I spend most of my time in Amherst, we have the, Phil, uh, the Fillmore Academic Center, which is a, a classrooms and dorms uh, in the Ellicott complex. Um, so students live there, students go to classes there, but oftentimes if you stop students, or I ask students in my classes, some of whom live in Fillmore, I say, do you know who the Fillmore Academic Complex is named for? And they have no idea. Oh. <laughs> On South Campus, in the newly uh, renovated Hayes Hall, there is this beautiful ornate mirror uh, that was dedicated by the class, I believe, of 1926. I have to look that up to be sure. Um, that is in honor of Miller Fillmore and his contributions to um, the university. So this is a Fillmore mirror <laughs> in River and Hayes Hall uh, that you can sort of see there. Um, and the university has sort of issued a, an official statement about Miller Fillmore, you know, saying that you know their commemoration of him. Uh, is really based upon his role in helping to found the university and serve as its first chancellor and is not, you know, an endorsement of any of his uh, policies as, as president or afterwards. There is also downtown um, in Buffalo the Miller Fillmore College, which is really the sort of the school of continuing studies where non-traditional students, non-matriculating students uh, can go and take uh, evening and weekend classes uh, for, sometimes for credit, uh, sometimes for not. Um, and the uh, Miller Fillmore College Associate Dean, uh, Larry Gingrich, you know, talked about how he thought it was appropriate to you know, name uh, Fillmore College for Fillmore because Fillmore was a self-starter um, and from humble beginnings. And this is the kind of background um, that students who attend Miller Fillmore College are coming from. Um, he thought Fillmore could in some way be inspiration to them for that. And of course, we all know Forest Lawn, uh, where Mira Miller Fillmore is buried, and the annual um, service there that's every year on his birthday. How many of you have actually attended that? Quite an event. Hopefully this year it won't be quite so cold. You can actually go to the great site. And of course, uh, I recognize the familiar faces from this. I'm sure all of you have seen this uh, short uh, episode from CBS Sunday Morning from a couple of years ago. Everyone's familiar with this. Let's watch it again. <laughs> to go here, although it may not, because I actually think there's not an internet connection. No, no, no. Okay. Oh, too bad. <laughs> Here about sort of Miller Fillmore's legacy and sort of trying to sort of get a handle on why it is folks uh, in East Aurora and in Buffalo love him so and, and how he's remembered here. As I was mentioning before, we're sort of in a kind of unique, interesting, 
volatile historical moment where we as a nation um, are coming to terms with, the, with this particular part of the past, and in, in specifically sort of the legacy of slavery in the United States as well as sort of the historical memory of the Civil War. So I was talking to you at the beginning about you know, how universities are really grappling with their uh, historical connections to slavery. This is also happening more broadly as uh, various towns and cities across the, across the United States are, are thinking about their Confederate monuments. Of course, this happens much more in the South than it does up here. Um, and in the past few years, we are actually seeing some of these big statues to you know, Confederate luminaries being removed. So uh, here, this one in New Orleans, May 2017, there was a big statue of Robert E. Lee in the middle of New Orleans, and that was taken down and actually moved to an undisclosed location where nobody quite knows. They won't say where Robert E. Lee is resting at the moment. He's no longer on his plinth uh, where he was there in Crescent City. And of course, it was the removal of another statue of Lee in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is the home of the University of Virginia, just a couple of weeks before I spoke there last, last fall, um, where um, this sort of rally of white supremacist folks uh, gathered there, which of course resulted in sort of two days of riots, um, and unfortunately the death of one woman there um, in Charlottesville. So there has been a considerable and sometimes violent backlash, right, to these conversations um, and to these efforts to remove um, some of these figures from the public space and to sort of reimagine uh, the public space, spaces where these kinds of Confederate um, monuments have been for the last really 100 years or so. Most of these monuments, in fact, went up in the early 20th century. 40, 50, 60 years after the Civil War. So they were of a particular moment. We can talk about that later if you want to. Um, so like I said, it's a really interesting moment. And, and lots of people in lots of different places are talking about you know, their particular location, their city's relationship to this part of the American past. What should it be? How should we remember these events? How should we commemorate them? Are there different ways to do that? Are there more productive ways, more inclusive ways to do that uh, that capture a wider variety of the issues that are more historically accurate? Um, and I think we can have that same kind of conversation um, here in Western New York about Miller Fulmer. Are there ways, different ways to commemorate him um, that is truer to the, his historical, to his place in history, to the historical record, and that can actually spur um, more exciting, uh, more genuine conversations about some of these deeper um, historical issues that we all share um, as Americans. And in order to do that, we really do have to talk about um, the Fugitive Slave Law and, of course, the Compromise of 1850, uh, Millard Fillmore's um, sort of national legacy, what he's most uh, well known for and, of course, most criticized for um, as that he did as he was president. Now, when Millard Fillmore supported the Compromise of 1850, he did so because he thought it was a way to avoid War. He thought it was a way to make the issue of slavery go away. And this really was um, Fillmore's sort of MO for his presidency. He thought that slavery and the controversy surrounding <coughs> slavery and slavery's potential expansion into those new Western territories, he thought it was a distraction. He was a Whig, right? And as a Whig, he was really interested in sort of building American infrastructure, building American business interests, strengthening American foreign policy. And to him, from his perspective, all this sort of uproar that was really heating up in the late 1840s and 1850s was really a distraction from what he wanted to focus on as president. Um, and so he thought that the Compromise of 1850 
um, which included the fugitive slave law, was going to be a way to sort of bring these two warring sides together. And you know, we can kind of look at these political cartoons from the day and think, oh God, that's such an exaggeration, right? Where people really sort of on the verge of violence as early as 1850. And the answer to that question is absolutely. For those of you who are interested, a very good friend of mine, her name is Joanne Freeman. She's a historian at Yale. Um, she um, actually, wrote, her first book was on the Burr and Hamilton duel. Uh, she's written a new book that's just come out in the last couple of weeks called Field of Blood, which is about violence in Congress leading up to the Civil War. You may all be aware, of course, uh, familiar with the, the very infamous caning of Charles Sumner, right, on the Senate floor, nearly killed Sumner, cracked his skull. But there were many other instances of fisticuffs, congressmen pulling you know, pistols and bowie knives on each other. And so her new book really catalogs this growing violent, uh, not only violent rhetoric, but actually violent behavior of congressmen in the 1830s, 1840s, and really the 1850s. So if you're interested in that, it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. And then it goes to show that this um, you know, political cartoon we have up there is really not far from the truth. People were at each other's throats even as early as 1850 over this question of slavery. So I know I'm in a room full of uh, history enthusiasts here and people who know a lot about this. So I, I, I hope I get better answers from you from these questions. <laughs> so does anybody know what the whole uproar was about that brought about the Compromise of 1850? What, what was the problem? What were people, what did there need to be a compromise about? We know it's something to do with slavery, but do you know the specifics? Expansion of the West and admission of new states. Expansion of the West, admission of new states. And the legislators that would be elected there. Right. Anything else to do with the Compromise of 1850? Would people be able to hold slaves in those states or not? Would people be able to have slaves? And would those new territories, those new states, be open to slavery? That's pretty much the crux of it. So here's a map sort of showing you the United States. And this is up to sort of September the 9th of 1850. Of course, September the 9th is the day that Miller Fillmore signs the Compromise of 1850. Um, so basically, what's at stake is the the fate of all of this territory, this unorganized territory, and also all of this territory that we won from Mexico in the Mexican-American War in, from 1846 to 1848. Um, so as Congress is debating whether or not these new territories are going to be open to slavery, a congressman named David Wilmot proposes the Wilmot Proviso, which basically says all of this new territory is going to be closed to slavery. Southern representatives and their constituents, slaveholders, reacted violently right, to this proposition because they believed in, that in order for their economic system to survive, that it was going to have to expand. Politically, this was important because, based upon the three-fifths clause in the Constitution, if you have all only free states coming into uh, the union, those representatives are at some point in the not very, you know, far off distant future going to outnumber, right? Free state representatives in Congress will begin to outnumber slave state representatives and slaveholders fear that eventually they would in fact outlaw or abolish slavery. So they wanted to keep their hand in in terms of representation. But economically, they also believe that in order for slavery to remain vital, to remain competitive, and to flourish, that it needed new territories, and new territories for, uh, for you know, agricultural expansion. <laughs> they really wanted to get, they really wanted to get here, to the West Coast, so that they could have routes to Asia and to China, trade routes. Um, so they actually imagined sort of a global expansion of slavery. They didn't have their eyes simply set on the western part of the United States. They really had their eyes set on the Pacific world. Okay. So that's really what they wanted. 
So in response to the Wilmot Proviso, you get uh, basically uh, what's known as the Alabama Platform, which was put forth uh, by Alabama Senator William Yancey. And basically it was the reverse, the exact opposite of the Wilmot Proviso that said all of these territories would be open to slavery and that any attempts to impede slavery's expansion into these territories should be considered unconstitutional. So those are your two extreme positions. Um, some folks who are sort of in the middle propose that, in fact, what should happen is that the Missouri Compromise Line, which is the southern border of Missouri here, should just simply be extended all the way to the west coast. And everything below it would be open to slavery, and everything above it would be closed. What's the problem with that? The problem is California, which is already heavily settled, very close to becoming a state, and the Missouri Compromise Line, of course, would split the bottom third of it off. Okay? They don't want that to happen. They want California to come in as a whole state, one way or the other, so that's not acceptable. So ultimately, after much debate, a much rancorous debate, uh, we get the Missouri Compromise. I should also say, do you know what it is that Southerners like William Lancey and the people who support the Alabama platform, what is it they say is going to happen if they don't get what they want? Secession. Secede, exactly. They say we're going to secede, which they've been threatening, by the way, for about 20 years. And they continually threaten that to every time something, some kind of issue with this came up. A lot of people were like, oh, here they go again, right? But as we know, eventually they do, in fact, So, uh, Henry Clay uh, comes up with the Compromise of 1850. Now, the Compromise of 1850 was an omnibus bill. The Fugitive Slave Law was just one part of that, actually one fifth of that. The Compromise of 1850 was five distinct bills. So the Fugitive Slave Law was one. Anybody want to name another? D.C. was slavery banned in D.C. Slave trade. The slave trade was banned in D.C. California free state. California is a free state. Yes. Yeah, organized yeah. territories could decide on their own. Popular sovereignty um, in those western territories. Texas boundary and that uh, stuff. Yeah, you're the expert. That's the one people always start. Right. So, the five bills. So, the, the first one here is Texas basically gives up all its Texas gives up all its claim to New Mexico. They had wanted to keep that and make Texas even bigger than it was, um, but in exchange for the federal government assuming Texas's national debt after the Mexican War, uh, it gives up all its claim to the New Mexico territory and we get basically sort of this, uh, you know, Texas ends up looking like we see Texas today. California, of course, comes in as a free state, the Missouri Compromise Line is not extended. Uh, in the District of Columbia, the slave trade, but not slavery itself, is outlawed. So you can no longer buy or sell people within the boundaries of the District of Columbia, but you can own slaves and keep them there. Um, these territories, uh, New Mexico and Utah, which were part of the Mexican concession, are going to be open to slavery determined by popular sovereignty. Okay? So it's possible uh, that the people who settle there might in fact vote to allow slavery in the territories. They might not, but it's going to be up to the people there. Congress is not going to make any, dis any decision based upon whether or not they will be open to that. And then of course the last sort of leg of the Compromise of 1850 stool is the Fugitive Slave Law. And it's actually not a new Fugitive Slave Law. It's an enhanced fugitive slave law. As I'm sure you, you heard about uh, in the spring with, with the other talk, there was a fugitive slave law in the United States since 1793. Okay? It's part of the, the Constitution. Uh, and it basically stated that 
any person bound to labor, right? That's the euphemism that's used in the Constitution. Does it say slave? Is this person bound to labor? Um, basically, can't go into one state and say, oh, you know, I'm free. Right? They're bound uh, to their condition upon the, the slave state or the state in which they originated. Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 basically said, you know, if, some, if a runaway, if a person sort of uh, runs away from slavery and goes into a free state, that doesn't mean they're free. And in fact, they have to be returned if um, the owner comes after them. The problem with the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 was it really had no enforcement mechanism. There was no, fed, at least on the federal level, there was no federal enforcement mechanism. And in the early 19th century, particularly in the 1830s and the 1840s, after abolition um, sort of takes off, a lot of northern states, including New York, pass what are known as personal liberty laws, which basically protect the rights of fugitive slaves, or anyone really, who are claiming residence in that particular state and limiting the ability of any slave catcher from a southern state to come into uh, those states or in certain municipalities um, to try to retrieve a fugitive slave. It gives a, a, anyone who's accused of being a fugitive slave the right to uh, habeas corpus, the right to testify in court, the right to present witnesses to say this isn't the person they say they are, or this per, you know this person doesn't have a right to come in here. So it's basically these personal liberty laws are making it difficult for slave owners to send their bounty hunters into northern states looking for runaway slaves. And of course, this is particularly important in an area like Western New York, which is on the path of the Underground Railroad. So slaves are, or fugitive slaves are coming through this area, uh, trying to make their way across the Niagara River into St. Catharines for the area in that part of Canada. So the Compromise of 1850 includes a newly sort of reinvigorated or enhanced fugitive slave law, which finally does give federal uh, enforcement powers to the old fugitive slave law. Basically what the new fugitive slave law does is that it makes it a federal crime for anyone to sort of aid and abet a fugitive slave. And you don't have, and this is for private citizens, right? People like you and I, and you don't have to necessarily know that a person that you might have given a job to or given a plate of food to or a drink of water to was a fugitive slave you could still be held in violation of federal law. You could be fined hundreds and not up to $1,000. You could spend months in jail for aiding and abetting a fugitive slave. Private citizens, people like you and I, were also compelled under the new fugitive slave law to assist any bounty hunter or magistrate or law enforcement officer who came to you and said, hey, I need you to come with me. We're you know, forming this posse to come and apprehend these fugitive slaves. You had to help, right, doing this. And if you refused, you could be fined, you could be sent to jail. Any law enforcement official, a magistrate, a court judge, a policeman in the city of Buffalo, who also refused to help in the apprehension of a fugitive slave could also be held to these same penalties. If you were apprehended and charged with being a fugitive slave, and you have to remember, this is in a period where people didn't carry around ID. There are no birth certificates. It's very difficult if someone sort of pressed you and said to prove you were who you said you were, that you were born free if you had black skin. Um, it would be very difficult for you to do that. Under the old personal liberty laws in most northern states, you could bring witnesses to say, you know, to come in and say, hey, I've known John ever since he was a kid. He was born here, he's a free person. This, you know, he's not who this slave hunter says he is. But under the new 1850 fugitive slave law, anyone who was charged with being a fugitive slave could not speak for themselves in court. They could not testify on their own behalf. They could not present witnesses on their own behalf. The new fugitive slave law also created, created these special commissioners or magistrates who were in charge of sort of holding these kangaroo court sessions. So basically all a, a southern bounty hunter had to do 
was to come in with a, with a signed affidavit from his owner <coughs> saying that he was acting on a slave owner's behalf to retrieve a particular person. He would say, this is that person, this is James or Celia or whoever it might be. You know, I recognize them, they who they say they are, and the special magistrate would say, okay. And that was pretty much the extent of a trial or a hearing if you were charged with being a fugitive slave. And of course, the kicker as well is this, these, these new sort of fugitive slave magistrates or agents who were in charge of these courts were given $5 for every fugitive slave they returned. So there is a financial enticement for these magistrates who you would think ought to be neutral parties, right, adjudicating this process, this extra, it's so an extradition process, but they're not. They're actually, there's an incentive for them to send a person back into slavery. But of course, if you've read, you know, Solomon Northup's 12 Years a Slave, or you've seen the film, right? A lot of people were kidnapped, right? Because they don't have ID. So these are people who may be born free. They're not, not necessarily fugitives who were vulnerable. Anyone with dark skin would be vulnerable to these kinds of slave hunting, which you can see here in the, in the, in the sign, uh, and these signs started to appear in cities all over the North, like Buffalo, Rochester, and Syracuse, right? Be on the lookout. There are slave hunters among us, and they're looking for you. Be suspicious. Don't talk to white people you don't know, basically, is, is what, these, um, what these signs are warning people to do. And this had an impact on African Americans living in and around Buffalo. Now, the 1850 census enumerated about 657, I think, African people of African descent, black people uh, who are marked as black um, here in the race category on the census. And the census, especially in the 19th century, you can almost, all, you know, pretty reliably assume that they undercount people, right? So whatever its population of Buffalo, it says it is, it's probably more than that. So if it says there are 657 people, African American people, black people living in Buffalo in 1850, there are probably several hundred, if not a thousand or so, more than that. Because the census enumerator just doesn't catch everyone, um, and they're not particularly interested in, you know, going back and making say pass uh, in a particular neighborhood. So these are two lines from the Buffalo Census of 1850 that I captured here. This is in the old first ward um, on the south side. Many of these black people, and you can go, if you're, if you're on Ancestry, you can pull up these, um, these census records and look for yourself. You'll find that a lot of these people, like this man, William H. Pope, and a woman that was living in his house, I'm not sure if it's wife, she's going by a different last name, Elizabeth, and I believe that says, Bounties or something, I'm not exactly sure how her last name is pronounced there. Um, they give southern birthplaces. Okay? So there's William Pope from Kentucky. There's Elizabeth, 27 years old, in 1850, so that puts her born in 1823, thereabouts. Most likely in 1823 in Louisiana, she's born a slave. I'd be willing to bet. Can't know for sure but almost, almost for certain, right? Um, are people like William Pope and Elizabeth, are they fugitives? Have they come to Buffalo, you know, looking for freedom, perhaps thinking about going to Canada, but they, but they stay in Buffalo and they settle in Buffalo? We can't know for sure. But if you look through those census records and you see all those southern birthplaces for all of those black people living in Buffalo at the time, you have to wonder. And of course, the 18th, and you might think, well, why would someone who's hiding out <coughs> talk, you know, sort of talk and sh and to the census enumerator who shows up at their door? Well, I think, you know, for one thing, the 1850 census is taken in June and July of the year. Fugitive slave law is not signed until September. Um, and I would imagine they feel pretty safe in Buffalo. 
There are reports in, in some of the old newspapers from the time of slave catchers uh, coming into the city looking for fugitives. And interestingly enough, they're often run off um, by Buffalonians. Sometimes black Buffalonians who sort of rally to their neighbor's defense. But sometimes these are mixed race crowds as well. Um, there's one really interesting, this is probably, probably 1849-1850, there's a, a mixed race crowd of people down around the Black Rock area who uh, actually take um, a fugitive who's been apprehended by a slave catcher, and sort of beat the hell out of the slave <laughs> catcher, take this guy uh, off the, the boat, take him down, to, or take him off the train, take him down to the Black Rock Ferry and across uh, the river into Canada. And this neighborhood where William Pope and Elizabeth are living in the Old Force Ward is a very racially integrated neighborhood. There are immigrants live in from you know, Poland, from Germany, um, living alongside people like William Pope and Elizabeth, um, migrants from the southern United States. Um, it's a really, it's, you know, it's something that you might not expect, right, because we live in a time of really sort of stark racial segregation, but in this period in the 19th century, in a place like Buffalo, um, in the city, it's not always that way. So there's some really interesting uh, sort of local history uh, to dig into there. So we can really only imagine what kind of fear, anxiety, or apprehension this new fugitive slave law, when it goes into effect in September, ignited for people like William Pope and Elizabeth um, and their neighbors who may have, in fact, been fugitives themselves. But we also have to remember, anyone with black skin would have been at risk for being tagged as a possible fugitive um, and um, taken, extradited, renditioned back to the South. Nationally, uh, historians estimate that about 100 people were uh, caught up sort of in this law, in the fugitive slave law, and taken into slavery in the South. About 100 nationally um, during the 1850s. Um, I think there were about two or three in New York State. I know there was one in Syracuse. I think there was also one near Rochester. And there was one locally as well. A young man, about 17 years old, by the name of Harrison, who was a fugitive from Virginia who had made his way to sort of the South Towns area. Um, he was residing and working on a farm in Chautauqua County near Busti. Um, and he was working there. Uh, it was actually a farm owned by a free black family uh, who worked their farm there and were giving uh, some aid uh, to Harrison. Uh, when the slave catchers and local magistrates arrived at the farm um, and, and ended up apprehending him there, he was taken uh -huh. to Buffalo. And you can see here a sort of a report in the Buffalo Express of this very, <coughs> very brief, very rushed uh, trial proceeding or hearing. Uh, it says the hearing was very brief. Um, it shows that the northern people are utterly abject and submissive to the compromise. They're talking about the compromise in 1850. Basically, this you know slave catcher didn't have to present any proof. Uh, that Harrison was the person he was looking for, that Harrison had in fact been a slave. He just presents the certificates of the commissioner, the commissioner stamps it, and that's it. And Harrison is gone, back to Virginia. And it says the proof was of a character so slight, they said that no man could recover in a civil suit the value of a pig. Right? If you were you know, talking about a lost piece of livestock in a civil suit, saying that your neighbor stole your pig, you would have to provide more evidence than this person did to say that Harrison was a fugitive slave that they were taking back to Virginia. So the city is really outraged by this. Um, and local people did try to, they, they got up lawyers and people for Harrison, but it was too late by the time they actually sort of got to the courthouse and were ready to try to put on some kind of, uh, you know, sort of legal maneuvers to, to stop his extradition. He 
interesting story about Harrison. About 15 years later, a young man from the Buffalo area who was in a New York regiment uh, in Virginia during at the end of the Civil War runs into someone who he claims is Harrison. Right? This had been a big case in Buffalo at the time. Uh, he's in Virginia toward the end of the Civil War, and he meets a, what they call at the time, a colored soldier, right? Um, and it's a formerly enslaved person who has joined the Union troops. He gets to talking with this man. This man has been to Buffalo. He knows the area, and you know, sort of they start teasing out the story, and this man is, in fact, Harrison. Virginian slave who was sent back into slavery who eventually escapes and joins the Union Army. So that is sort of the, the 1850s leading up to the Civil War sort of milieu that I think, uh, you know, gives us something to chew on when we're thinking about Miller Fillmore, who he was and what his impact on this country and on this region uh, was. Of course, it, we would also, I think, be remiss to, to talk about sort of the effects of this on Fillmore himself. Um, basically, it sort of ruins the Whig Party. It breaks up the Whig Party, which is in his party. In 1856, he actually becomes the presidential candidate of the Know Nothing, the American Party, which was a white nationalist, anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant party. And you See here in this cartoon, right? They're accusing. Ooh, <laughs> they're accusing, of course, the Irish that they're a liar. We see in the German beer running away with the ballot box. <laughs> Typical uh, sort of uh, know nothing kind of the know nothing vision of the world. And of course, the know nothing comes from they sort of said, you know, we know nothing. You know, they weren't supposed to sort of they were sort of a secret organization. And they were running for the president. And Miller Fillmore, by all accounts, isn't really all that interested um, in the no nothing. He's not, you know, um, he doesn't, his heart's not really in this candidacy, but he does allow them to sort of put him uh, on the ballot as their presidential candidate. I don't know what that says about his sort of moral vibe, but uh, not great. And I think that's another sort of, you know, check against um, Miller Fillmore's legacy, unfortunately. Um, that he becomes sort of the face of this nativist white supremacist party and short-lived, although I think uh, it reiterates, you know, we see versions of it later on in the 20th century. So how should we remember Miller Fulmore? I don't know that I have the answer to that question. He's a complicated individual. He is president of the United States at an incredibly volatile time. Uh, he's responsible, not solely, but he does in fact sign the Compromise of 1850, which is one of the most controversial and I think consequential pieces of legislation in American history. And that history, as difficult as it is to, um, to sort of grapple with, um, and it, it poses some difficult questions, and it makes it very difficult to have a sort of simply celebratory um, of, you know, narrative about Fillmore, I think, in fact, it does give us an opportunity to really sink our teeth into the man and his politics and his sort of cultural and political movement um, in a way that I think we really have not been able to do that with Fillmore because we avoid this kind of unsavory or, or unsympathetic um, things that, 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 it, that it makes us think of with regards to Fillmore. And for any of you who have visited any of the presidential houses lately, Mount Vernon, uh, Monticello, um, James Madison's home, his name is, the name of the place is this Highland? Mount Pelier. Mount Pelier. Mount Pelier. yeah. The, all of these big presidential homes are really reforming and revamping their public presentation and exhibitions with regard to these men and trying to balance, you know, their, the legacy we want to appreciate about them, Madison's daughter of the Constitution, or Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, Washington, the father of our country, with at the same time sort of recognizing and appreciating their participation in slavery. And, the, and more importantly, I think a really 
really think Montpelier does this better than any of them. I've been to Montpelier lately. They just opened this new exhibit about enslaved people um, at Montpelier last year. It's absolutely magnificent in thinking about who these people were as individuals, and they've done a, the archivists there have done amazing work trying to excavate the identities and the histories and the family connections of the enslaved people at Montpelier and thinking about what it was like right, for them to live um, uh, the lives that they were having while Madison, Jefferson, and all of these other people were doing what they were doing. So I think there is there are ways to do this that are constructive, that allow people to continue to engage with American history and the founding fathers um, and our presidents, uh, but in you know new and inventive and creative ways that don't erase such an important part of their past and our past as well. And personally, I would support um, maybe a musical, right? Hamilton was so popular. What about Fillmore? A musical, right? Why not? I mean, it would be just like it. Right? And, and, and if, you know, if Alec Baldwin gets tired of playing Donald Trump, he can play. American presidents, he's, you know, he's slimmed down, though. Just getting going, 
and the cotton gin had made cotton production more feasible, required <coughs> more slave labor. England was going full bore and wanted to give lots of money, and so it was a it was sort of the Silicon Valley of of that time. So the people in the South, you know, had a lot at stake here, and slavery was what they needed to get it done. So they perhaps felt about it, you know, more strongly. And again, people in the East were feeling very, you know, ethical and, and concerned about the, their view of the correctness of it. That's a great analogy, the Silicon Valley at the time. I really do, yeah, the cotton boom in the early 19th century, it does. It makes people incredibly wealthy. Um, and, you know, a little bit later in 1858, James Henry Hammond, who's a senator of South Carolina, you know, as, you know, Approaching sort of the, the the you know the sort of point of no return of the Civil War, you know, he stands up at one point in the United States Senate and he says, "There's no power on earth that would dare make war on cotton." <laughs> right? Um, and he really sort of believes that they are so powerful and they make so much money and they're so wealthy that they can sort of bluster and sort of bully their way as they had, right? For for pretty much the uh, the the duration of American history up until that point. There's two other geographical things. First, the oil of uh, gold had been discovered in California, and this was very important. So that was a big, big part of the play. The other thing you mentioned was Texas, and that the United States had taken over. That was part of the compromise. And I think, you know, looking at it as a compromise is very important. The other thing is that Texas had this big debt, and they'd done that in, in uh, you know, securing their own republic and had become, you know, become part of the United States. But then, as now, Texas has a large border with Mexico, and there was not slavery in Mexico, as I recall. No. And this was a major issue in the contentious area, not overly populated, with a lot of flux across the border, and that was a major thing. And bringing Texas, you know, finding a place for Texas, good or bad, you know, was an important accomplishment of the, of the compromise. So Southerners had, um, you know, they had like designs on getting Cuba and expanding into Mexico. Nicaragua, Central yeah. America. Can you like, elaborate on the, um, what were their designs on Asia? Like, that's fascinating. I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't think they had colo colonials. <laughs> they wanted trade. They wanted trade with China. Right? They wanted sort of you know access to those uh, markets for cotton and and and, and okay. sort of their production uh, for that. So they did imagine sort of a global sort of trade network. I mean, the British had already started growing cotton in India right. by this point. Um, so if, I'm, if they're imagining sort of being able to, and there had been cotton grown in the in the valleys in China as well, you know, for millennia. Right, so they're imagining new places to to do to do that and to do that kind of business, um, sort of on, on a global scale. Because you know, really, you know, the arid southwest is not a great place to grow anyone, <laughs> right? Um, so they don't have designs on it for that particular uh, purpose. Um, but I think they are looking; they're looking further. Did the Mormons take position on slavery for or against? That's an excellent position. Uh, I mean, they don't have slavery. I don't know that they came. They had wives. Else know? They had wives. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I have to look that up. I'm not sure if they had an official position on it or not. Mm -hmm. about something else. So Henry Clay, author of the Compromise of 1850 along with Stephen Douglas, is lauded as the great compromiser. So then this bill goes across the desk of the president in September of 1850, which is Millard Fillmore. So why isn't he also lauded? He doesn't seem to be. Right. I think because it wasn't his, I mean, he just signs it. It's not his. It's not I'm not just saying the idea. basis yeah. of this, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's all praise. Well, then why not praise the president? Mm -hmm. Yes, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's Clay's bill, 
I mean, Bill Moore does play a role in making sure that Whig congressmen vote for it because there are a lot of northern Whig congressmen who are not in favor of it. Um, some young sort of first-term congressmen, and he does sort of apply pressure to them to say, if you don't do that, you know, I'm not going to support you. you know, the party's not going to support you in your re-election bid. So he does sort of put some, um, you know, political muscle behind it. Well, there's still irony there that's unfair. And the, unfair. Other, the other factor is John Kennedy's book, Profiles of Courage. A good third of it is about the compromise mm -hmm. and the courage that these senators showed to go against their constituents to support the compromise. So again, uh, Webster and, and Clay and Sam Houston are praised for yeah. the compromise of 1850, right. but Millard is vilified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's mm -hmm. the... In here, yeah, in here he was just observing all this debate for months, and then it, unfortunately it falls on his hands. But we like to tell the story that um, his, his worst enemy, Thurlow Weave, was the one who got to write Miller Fillmore's first biography. His worst enemy wrote his biography and gave this whole negative tinge to Miller Fillmore's history, which has stuck. Mm -hmm. And Finkelman's book, who he wrote a book a couple years ago, I swear he just read what Thurlow Reed wrote, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it just couldn't be more. It's ridiculously negative. Mm -hmm. So we, we struggle with all these other sources and points of view and say, well, Miller bears, bears the brunt. Miller mm -hmm. bears the brunt. Right. Yeah. We address it, but we do. You know, um, I think this, there's just irony there that's not fair. Mm -hmm. But he's also president, so he's he's head of the branch to yeah. yeah. enforce the law. Well, and the enforcement was so spotty and irregular and botched up that he doesn't he doesn't appear to be a good executive in that function. The the bigger issue I've heard from people with Miller Fillmore is not due to slave law. It's his American Party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That really I think may it's have hard to defend. That's very hard to defend that he put his name on that, but also that it, it sort of was the nail in the coffin for anything he did before that, too. Like, there was no, from a, on a national level, we all know what he did in Buffalo and everything, but on a national level, right. the last taste we have of Miller Fillmore is this mm -hmm. white supremacist party, yeah. and there's no getting around it. Like you said, I read that, like, that's, they put that out. <laughs> there's no interpretation. Yeah. They even put that out. and. Even trying to say, well, he didn't really know he was being nominated. They just kind of, no, like he was running. Yeah. He won Maryland. Like he won a state, which is better than most third party candidates. <laughs> so that's really, that's the part where people, every time I've heard criticism of him, it's the, he's a racist for running on the American party. Some people mix it up. They think he ran on that party the first time. Right. Um, but that's where I hear it. Not necessarily the future slave law was bad. His role, some people may not even know his role, but it's that. I think that's what really there was. He could have saved himself, maybe, <laughs> um, but he just that yeah. that really was it's hard a tough to one. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. And we've known about Alec Baldwin for years. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I didn't find that. I mean, I found that on the internet. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> the irony is that there is a, a musical written. It's called Millie, and it's quite bad. <laughs> or we would have done it by now. <laughs> you can lend Manuel Miranda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Miller yeah. Fillmore. Yeah. I have sort of a kind of a personal question about your your. I get in trouble, and I'm sure other folks that because of where we come from. That yeah, we automatically get assumed that we're going to defend him, mm -hmm. oh. like because oh, okay. we're from East Aurora, oh, right. <laughs> or from Buffalo, or from UB. Right. That do you get that? Like, do you get like that? People think you're biased because of that he was the first chancellor, or like here we, you know. Right. And balancing that, yes, we want to. We we're trying. The community's trying to raise money in order to keep the plate open, but that's not necessarily an endorsement of his presidency. But it's very hard. To right. Honestly, I'm going to tell you, um, when I gave this talk at UVA, um, and there was a sort of a, I was on a panel about Northern universities, most of the stuff was focused on, you know, Lady Mary, and UVA, and University of Georgia, and all these other places. You know, people came 
names of northern users, and, and, and there were people who were like, who was Miller Fillmore? <laughs> <laughs> no, so then I think there was a presumption that I was going to uh, sort of talk about, you know, how we should, you know, give Miller Fillmore a break. And then, of course, you need to hear what I have to say, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm not, not uh, you know, sort of advocating that he should, you know, should really be cut any slack, because I think he does bear a lot of responsibility um, for, you know, for the future of slave law. Um, but yeah, it is. It's, it's a tough thing to try to sort of balance because he is a president, right? He does have a, a you know an attraction here and a connection to this area that I think ought to be um, cultivated, right, and nurtured. Um, but the question is sort of how to do that and how to um, I think sort of honor sort of his wider legacy. And I think he has the potential to do that. I think he is an interesting figure, and he lives in, I think, for me, I mean, it's the period I focus on, which I think is the mo one of the most interesting, you know, periods in American history. There's so much going on. There's so much at stake. Um, I think there's a lot for people to really sink their teeth into with him. Um, so I hate it when I hear people think, you know, it's just kind of the president for him. Well, it was like the Mo Rafa piece. I actually didn't really like it. How it came out because it turned out it was sort of like Finkelman versus East Aurora, and, and I had I had criticized Miller during that interview, but the part that got put right. in was he right. lowered the price of the postage stamp, and then Finkelman <laughs> going, "What do you do?" And so it was sort of this fight, like we, it wasn't a deep. I get how Mo does yeah. that; it's fun, it's great, it brought tons of people to the great. But from a deep standpoint of understanding his presidency and right. his things that we can learn, the power of the vice presidency, you know, we're talking about that today, you know, right. like, you know, that, there's lots we can learn on. Yeah, be careful who your vice president is, because yeah. he could be president. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. um, so that it's just not, it's, I, I appreciate the deep discussion of those issues as opposed to this. this and I think project. public history institutions, historical societies, museum houses can have those kind of deep they don't always do because I think it's difficult. People aren't necessarily equipped to, to sort of do that. It's hard. Um, but I, like I said, as you can see, some of these other institutions, of course, you know, places like Monticello and Montpelier have, you know, magnificent budgets in which to do that, right? Um, but it can, I think it can be done. It takes a lot of work. Um, it's not always comfortable, but I think it can be done. Please come to our museum and see what you Yes! Like we, 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 we try really hard to present a balanced picture of him, good and bad. Most definitely. And you should know your presidents. For someone to say they don't know or never heard of Miller Fillmore. Uh, and this was a, you know, an academic history uh, conference. I mean, know. William Henry Harrison was what president <laughs> for 30 days. <laughs> and I suppose they know him. But Charles <laughs> 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 Miller.